What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest number 208 at block height 614,944 on, what day is it? Tuesday, January 28th, 2020. So, how are you guys dealing with the impending viral apocalypse? I actually... Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> actually, I have dengue fever and my kids too so <laughs> we we have another kind of virus here <laughs> are you fucking kidding me <laughs> no oh man so should we do the thing that everybody else is properly uh doing and just pretend to be a bunch of expert virologists and, and assess the the situation for the next 20 minutes well one thing is for sure china has uh, is under reporting its number as always yeah, but they're communists. What do you expect? No, I, I expect this, yeah. <laughs> I just want to state facts. That's why I said it. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, is there anything actually useful we can say? Um, I, I, here, here, okay, I, I will give my complete amateur medical advice. Yeah, the masks aren't going to stop you from catching anything, but wear one anyway, asshole, because if you catch something, you won't spread it. Well, the thing is, a lot of people, I mean, at least in the major cities in China, they're out, they already have masks because of the smog. So, I mean, why aren't they? Why wouldn't they have them? I mean, the, the Western bastards, you, you, you get me sick, I'm, I'm going to fucking get you. I, 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 I'm waiting until that virus does its job, buddy. Whack! It's an interesting virus because it's not, it's not as deadly as like SARS or, or other viruses before, but it's, it is targeting what people and, and, and we, people whose immune system is already weak. But, but anyway, but, but it, it spreads through human to human and it has like, uh, one to 14 days uh, period while the symptoms doesn't appear yet you are infectious so it's like what the fuck do you do with that you know hide in a in a, in a room with a computer screen all day Wait, oh I'm, wow I'm, my life isn't gonna have to change at all i'm confused why are, why are we giving amateur medical advice right now is this even a big thing i mean could be could not be we're going to find out with everybody else. I uh, just just one note here. It is going to be, I think, because there is the Chinese New Year, which is the largest migration of the world. And the Chinese New Year, two days over and everyone is flying back to their country. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll be just say, like, take common sense precautions. Don't be a moron and go piss away half of your savings on all the, the miracle solutions uh, and realize that a real pandemic is something that would last a year or two. So your one splurge on a $1,000 mask or a trip to the grocery store, um, that's not magically going to keep you safe if this does become something serious. All right, I don't know. Is, is, that, is that enough uh, playing doctor for you guys? I, I can pretend for a lot longer. All right, all right, all right. All right, let's, let's pretend to be Bitcoin experts instead, guys. That sound like more fun? Okay. No. Tough crowd today, tough crowd. <laughs> pretending, pretending to be an expert is never fun. I don't find it fun. <laughs> apparently, apparently, other people find it fun. They find it so much fun that they, you know, scam people out of their savings. But I don't find it fun. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's give our amateur opinion on the news today. So 
sure everybody has seen the announcement uh, by Square Crypto that they're dropping a Lightning development kit that's actually being built off of the Rust library for Lightning that Matt Carello uh, put together. I think last year is when he started it, I want to say. But um, yeah, so this is probably confusing to anybody not really paying attention to the, the kind of developer angle of things. But, you know, one, one of the the arguments and, and opinions I keep giving on the, the lightning space and the different clients out there is I think C lightning is going to eat the other clients lunch just because of the, the architectural choice when, when it comes to their whole plugin system where they just expose the, the low level functions of, of the different daemons that make up C lightning so that you can customize and compose them however you want with just a, a little plugin that you install on top of C Lightning to really customize the behavior. And that's exactly what wallet developers, businesses, you know, different services are going to need to do to really maximize, you know, the, the ability to make money off of Lightning Network. And Square with, with this elder SDK is pretty much doing that on crack times a thousand like it's not just a single programmer or set of programs that you can get a, a more dynamic or flexible um you know call to through an api it's literally just the individual pieces that you can plug together only use the pieces you want to it's it's taking the entire client itself and just making all the pieces you know lego bricks you can put together however you want and that is absolutely a good thing in this space because one of the, the huge problems with when it comes to Lightning, if, if you're trying to, to build something or to integrate that into an existing wallet, it's a pretty complicated multi-piece protocol that's entirely interactive. And when, when you have the, the kind of architecture that all of the other um, projects are building it's it's pretty much just to one degree or another a single piece of software um, and you just you know use it for what it does or you don't you know and C lightning is a lot more flexible and extendable but you know the the example um, I think if you if you want to um, really get into square and Matt's perspective you should check out the tales from the crypt um, he just did with Marty Bent and Matt Odell but um, you know, one of the examples he points out as to why this can be so much more useful than a single client is look at Electrum trying to integrate um, the Lightning Network. They effectively had to make their own implementation from scratch because all of the other clients out there, it wasn't really a simple way to pull that into Electrum. It's a whole standalone program with its own dependencies, its own wallet. You, you, you would have pretty much just had to, to nest a whole other wallet inside of that wallet to really integrate Lightning into Electrum any other way. And this type of development kit would have made that really easy to do, but it wasn't there. And so, you know, I think as far as like the first big thing Square is doing to really try to get into the development side of, of the ecosystem, I mean, this is perfectly logical place to start i'm a bit confused what does this have to do with c lightning just the fact that you know c lightning's got their the whole plugin architecture so you can customize c lightning's behavior like you, you don't even need to do that now you can just only take the pieces of a lightning client you're going to use and only like roll that into your software you know what i mean it's it's making things even more modular and customizable than C Lightning does with their plugins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, Square is not building on that, isn't Square building on Matt's uh, Rust Lightning library? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what the whole software development kit is being built out of. And so that's my point is like it's it's going the direction that C Lightning was trying to go, like be flexible and customizable, but way more than even C Lightning is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I it's it's something that probably I'm going to use. I tried it before, 
but uh, it's like uh, it's not as easy as 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 they were claiming previously. But uh, probably now the square is behind it. It improved a lot, so I think it's. I have to try it again. Mm -hmm. You know, I I really think a lot of the the things that I thought Sea Lightning would just eat the lunch for in terms of use cases or uh, projects, I think. <laughs> I think uh, Matt's rust kit might just sneak in and uh, get past him there. We'll see. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of slide along into the next one, though. It's actually also related to S Square proper, not the uh, Square crypto organization. But um, Square was just granted a patent from the U.S. Patent Office for a payment network. Um that would effectively let both sides of a purchase um, use totally different currencies. So I could pay you with Bitcoin over the Lightning Network and you can, I don't know, decide I want Ethereum or some other shitcoin or fiat shitcoins. And it just seamlessly plugged that out in, in the background. Like the, they receive the Bitcoin from the, the person paying and they drop USD into your account as the merchant. And like this right here, I mean, should have been obvious a mile away. And like this is definitively laying out what Square's plan in this space is. They are putting all the, the resources that tactically make sense to into lightning software and actually getting that usable out there. Um, you know, deeply penetrating into the, the consumer market. And then when Bitcoin's price really starts getting to the point that it's making sense to use as money, boom, they just plug the, the payment processor business square into the edge of the lightning network. And now zap, 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 zap. Everybody can just route their fucking lightning payments to square. The merchant can then be credited in fiat directly if they want to. No more tax liabilities or issues. They never touch the Bitcoin to have the potential for gains on it. Receive it directly in Bitcoin themselves to be credited in a custodial account and just pull things out as they want. But like it, it is crystal clear. You plug these two things together and boom, all of the Square merchant customers could just flip a switch and start accepting Lightning. And have all the issues of dealing with a volatile currency like that just magically dealt with nobody's gonna nobody's gonna re ah the merchant processor why patent it well because as much as it sucks we live in a world of patents and if you don't patent things that you could have um somebody can come compete against you and do better yes yeah, so you are you are intentionally trying to to delay progress it's like snore signatures the whole ecdsa magic was created because snore signature snore was patented you know and actually i i have a very strong opinion on it right now because in wasabi we are just having the exact same debate and it's not about patenting anything it's it's about copywriting or patenting just the wasabi wallet name as 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 the name that wasabi wallet or or the logo and i think that's a very sets a very very bad precedent and and i'm at least i'm trying to 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 fight against it with with all i can because if once a company goes down into that direction to try to 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 <clears throat> to take their territory in 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 anything then it can go very far and i don't think that's a that's a good way to go well i mean i don't like patents dude and i'm not like i i'm not a fan of patents i don't think that's a legitimate thing but we don't really know how they're going to act with that patent yet and also, it's like, I'm mostly just talking about what this company's plans are. You know what I mean? Like, they are clearly trying to get themselves set up as, like, we flip a switch and everybody using our service can accept Bitcoin at the snap of a finger. And, yeah, like, I, I don't like patents. I don't think that's a legitimate 
law. But that's the world we live in. I don't want to live in this world then. <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear you. But I mean, you know, it's you know, like Meow just said in the chat box, you know, Blockstream has patents, but they also have their defensive patent pledge where you can use any patent they have that you want as long as you open up your patents. So it's kind of a way to, to hack the the patent system out of existence with itself if the the incentive works out i mean for all we know they could wind up doing something like that with it we don't know but you know the point is they have this patent now you put these two things together the the lightning kit and trying to push that and this patent and it's like it, it is crystal clear square is trying to set themselves up to have a massive involvement in retail use of bitcoin all right so what's that up next um oh janine you're you're up with this fun one I, f I forgot about this um i mean i don't know if it's necessarily fun as just pathetic and repetitive and i'm getting tired of this shit kind of stuff so um you if you've listened to us for a while you've probably heard us bring up a number of times uh digiconomists and how shit it is um how shit it has been over the years at um claiming to estimate how much energy bitcoin or the bitcoin network or more specifically bitcoin mining is consuming um and if you want to check that out we talked about it in episode 136 specifically and also 143 i think that was the coin shares report on um, energy usage and that was a lot more optimistic um, or rather it was it was more realistic and uh, the numbers were a lot better and not as dire and apocalyptic as Digiconomist uh, makes it seem but unfortunately uh, people from uh, it's a kind of unfortunate thing that like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, even though they have people um, involved in their organization who have benefited from using Bitcoin, they don't they don't make it part of their um, purview to, you know, spread awareness about it. They're not really interested in it. And as a result, you get people who have really terrible opinions, um, especially about uh, when it comes to energy consumption. So there is a member of the Freedom of the Press Foundation who uh, got some heat, I think this was yesterday, um, for tweeting, uh, if you work in Bitcoin in 2020, you deserve to have all of your assets seized to pay, pay for climate uh, reparations, which should extend to all historical earnings. Likewise, if you work in fossil fuels, of course. So she's basically saying if you work in Bitcoin, you have as much culpability for climate change as someone working in fossil fuels and you deserve to have your assets seized. Um, and quoting uh, the quote tweet that she made was uh, someone else uh, linking to Judge Economist about how much electricity usage uh, Bitcoin mining has. Um, so again, just want to reiterate that this is uh, bullshit. Um, you can see uh, that just from the number of replies and, and the content of some of the replies, which actually linked to other research. Um, if you want to see a comprehensive look at the topic, uh, there was a talk by uh, Tyler Bain, who I think is actually a listener of this show. And he gave a talk at <laughs> the devil. he gave a talk at the blockchain training conference last year, and he his talk was about um, proof of work mining energy consumption. And he there was one really interesting part where he plotted on a graph the estimates. Um, I think I'm pretty sure it's energy usage. It might have been something else, but um, I remember it being a plotted graph. And Digi Economist was on there as being one of the points and there's been a number of other studies that we've talked about i think the, in episode 136 we were talking about one from like a university in hawaii or something uh maui and so all of the estimates like vary a lot and a lot of them don't really have a good methodology for coming to those estimates or at least they don't share what the methodology is 
Um, and so that was a really interesting graph because it showed not only how different a lot of the estimates were, but how they've changed over time. So if you want to see that, um, his talk was titled Cryptocurrency Proof of Work Mining Energy Consumption. Uh, and then his name, Tyler Green, is in the title. You can find a video of that on YouTube. Yeah, it's definitely going to be on the, uh, the show notes. But um, yeah, like this is not going away. It's, this narrative is not going to die. Um, the way that that environmentalists and I, I don't mean people with rational, sensible actions they want to take to preserve the environment. I mean, the radical lunatics who think if we don't turn all the gas off in 10 years, everybody's going to die. Um, they're going to start latching on to Bitcoiners um, instead of or with billionaires. It's going to happen. That is going to be a massive political narrative that starts spreading everywhere and we, we just need to accept it at this point i mean <laughs> has common sense ever stopped an ideological political narrative i can't think of a single example in my life yeah and i also like i mean it's definitely an extreme i don't really want to talk too much about her comments because i mean these are just the kinds of comments that like this is probably the most extreme one a lot of people just shout angrily and say don't use bitcoin bitcoin is evil but this is like saying you deserve to have your assets seized for the rest of your life or the historical earnings what what have you earned before and that's like some somebody is very angry and unfortunately this anger is not based in any really scientific uh background so um yeah it's what just mean the narrative says you're an evil person and so it's okay to do whatever we want to you yeah so um obviously this um <laughs> this was one of the more controversial uh reactions to digiconomist because uh, most of the time, it's just people getting angry, but this time um, she's actually advocating for people to have their assets seized or that they deserve to have their assets seized uh, and that they have the same culpability as the fossil fuel industry. Um, but that's kind of a funny thing to advocate for, as was shown by many of the responses to it, because, uh, for example, Jameson Lop said, um, come and take them. Uh, and that's because the whole point of Bitcoin is to develop a digital money that is not easily seized uh, to support whatever moral grandstanding someone comes up with uh, while they're in power and wants to pass that down to everyone. Yep. And uh, going to be plenty, plenty more of it. All right. So uh, give me one second. I need the news to get shit back up. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. I just don't like the girl from you, Jima. All right, so the next thing we're diving into, um, some big news with Schnorr. And the reason we didn't talk about it first is because on-chain Bitcoin sucks. Lightning Bitcoin is way better. Fight me, Rodolfo. But <laughs> the uh, the uh, Schnorr and Taproot bips have officially been assigned numbers are officially accepted Bitcoin BIPs, and we are now into the conversational territory of issues with the implementation itself. And then the fun game of, hey guys, you want to try the first soft fork since SegWit and the UASF and the NYA and all that stuff? Do you feel lucky, punk? Do you? Yes. Is that the right answer? Yeah, if, I guess so. if it's not, then no. Ah, okay, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, like, I'd, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's important to have a discussion before we throw a deployment out there as to whether we should use BIP9 again or BIP8 is another option or, or maybe some kind of longer term thing that starts with BIP9 and then moves to something else. Because you know we're we're the the next market cycle that we go through and really bull it up and hit that peak we we are going to be orders of magnitude bigger than than we are right now like you, people are not going to recognize the dynamics of this space and how information flowing through it works anymore and 
how are we going to handle upgrades in that environment? But yeah, okay, if we just throw out Taproot, whatever, it goes through no problem. Okay, but what about the next time? So it's, it's th th there isn't really any kind of contention or reason I see for anybody to, to try to throw a wrench in, in the gears for Taproot or Schnorr here. But there's a lot more stuff down the line that we're going to be trying to get into the protocol. So let's actually step back a second and let's think this through. Like, how should we deploy this if there was going to be contention? How do we manage that contention and engage with it, discern its legitimacy or not? Like, even though I don't think any of these things are going to be problems for this BIP or, or this fork, we should still have this conversation anyway, because it's going to be a problem for something down the line. I, th mm -hmm. I think... I think we should ignore all those questions and do it like Bcash did it, where they implement code that they don't understand, uh, and they do it regardless of whether they're ready because they want to say that we did it first, um, and also do it uh, when you don't actually care about any of the privacy benefits that comes with it. I think that's a good strategy. But it's too late. We already did all the, the stuff the other way. Oh boy, I have a lot of thoughts on this that... Uh... Regarding what you're saying is that was exactly my concern on SegWit activation that yeah, we somehow got it activated through UASF and all kind of shit. Uh, but but uh, it we just did not have a discussion that would set a precedent for future soft forks. Anyhow, my 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 little thinking was okay whatever segwit was over politicized sized so hopefully we are not going to get into all this shit storm again in the future and and whoever wanted to leave already left to bitcoin cash so so oh, maybe it's not going to happen anytime soon and that's that's my that, that's yet to be see right uh, as soon as it gets into bitcoin core we will see uh that's one uh anything to add to that or can i go on to a related topic i mean like my my worry is like yeah the uasf was necessary and it worked but that could have gone way differently and been way messier and it's like, yeah, that was an important demonstration in Bitcoin's history. But like, you're out of your fucking mind if you just think for the rest of eternity, no matter how big we get, that we can just UASF things. Like, no, like people just won't agree on it. So like the, the bigger we get, the more that type of attitude becomes a, a big risk of disrupting the whole system. And we, like we... We can't just act like we just UASF something if anybody has a problem. Like there's going to come a point where there are legitimate problems with something that a bunch of people want. And okay, accept that and, and stay with Bitcoin or fork off and build something else. And people need to accept that. Like we need to realize that is how the dynamics will play out at scale. And we need to start thinking about how do we assess that shit at that type of scale so that we don't just split the whole system because people think oh we can just uasf it or we're not actually seeing some legitimate holdouts or criticism like we need to start thinking about that mm -hmm. so le let's do a reverse shit sandwich with this that First, we discuss something that worries us. Then I will say something that's uh, that's kind of nice and funny, and then discuss something else that worries me. Uh, so let's go to the the next one, which 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 I've seen a news article. I, I'm not. I don't remember where. Maybe CoinDesk that uh, that cited me as a as a reviewer or someone who was discussing this this pull request and literally the only contribution i had to this pull request is you know top root in the code comments top root was sometimes capitalized t 
and sometimes it was lower case t <laughs> and i made it <laughs> made it consistent <laughs> but it made the news <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. And it's like, you know, I'm not trying to fucking shit on you or like downplay you or anything. But because of that article now, a bunch of people are going to look at you and your opinions on things and assume that you dove through that whole code base and like learned all of it and audited it and it, you didn't. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, how is that going to affect people's attitudes towards things? Like we need to start thinking about that kind of shit. Like I've been quoted by Coindesk before as a Bitcoin core developer. And it's like, how in the holy fuck do you misattribute that? Like in what universe do you get out of any interaction with me that I'm a core developer? I'm not even close. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> this is a good, good transition into the next thing, which which I'm going to talk about because, oh boy, this pull request. Uh, so on the one hand, I'm very happy that that Bitcoin Core is finally moving. On the other hand, just yesterday I was listening to, uh, uh, not listening, I was actually researching the topic that the, what is the optimal size of the pull of a pull request and the research was very clear about that over 250 maximum 500 lines the developers the reviewers spend just as much time on the pull request those are very large as the time on the 250 50 500 lines of changes pull requests which means if the pull request very large then it's just not get reviewed because no one can review it properly. And this pull request, what Peter really did, is the largest pull request I have ever seen in any GitHub repository. So I really hope there is someone who can review it properly. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's part of it. It's like that we should take our time. Like, you know, I mean, this isn't uh anything like segwit that there is not this group stonewalling it for no rational reason or reason and intentionally trying to be like but let's do this instead it's like no this is it's just here there there's no bullshit about it there's no let's not do that and do this instead it's just here to look at so let's take our time and have these conversations because unlike segwit it isn't the issue of let's get it now or we're probably not going to get it and they're going to try and steer the whole system in a different direction. It's just like, here's the one thing. Everybody seems to want it. There doesn't seem to be any reasonable criticism. So let's take our time. Let's fucking actually let it sit there and, and give people the time to audit through everything and then have that conversation in the slow steps. Like, okay, it's good. All right. How do we want to roll this out here? Do we want to make sure now there's no criticisms or arguments against this? Like, how do we handle that if they are? Like, we can we can take our time. That this isn't the heated make or break situation that Segwit was. Mm -hmm. I, I I agree. I, I would just add only one thing to that. What you forget, which might be the most important part, is that capitalized uproot consistently in the code comments. Without that, this pull request <laughs> is can be dropped <laughs> all right next topic oh man yeah so uh this i'm actually surprised no par i told you about this and you said you didn't even hear about it but this is actually because of you um that this exists to my understanding <laughs> but um btc pay dropped the btc pay uh vault to have a, a kind of desktop app um to specifically manage your your wallet and signing transactions using a hardware wallet um connected to btc pay and from my understanding they pretty much used all of your work um in c sharp implementing the the hwi interface in wasabi for that to actually make this possible so <laughs> we have another 
um, option. I mean, it's like at this point, like how many different options are there to use your node with your wallet? There's the BTC Pay uh, Vault now. There's the Electrum personal server set up. There's Samurai and Dojo. There's um, what the fuck else am I forgetting? Um, AB Core. <laughs> Or did no? I said Wasabi, didn't I? No, Electrum, VTC Pay, and okay, Samurai yeah. Dojo, and, and Wasabi, and then there's also the AB Core hookup, and um, like the the Green Wallet from Blockstream. Like this, this is starting to get really fucking nice. Like it, it used to be like hack it together yourself or run this one random obscure thing to to hook your wallet up to your node and it's like there's six different options right now that are all differing degrees of you can handle this if you don't get confused by a web browser mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and even hvi is creating a gui interface so you could use uh, hvi in a more more so for now, with Bitcoin Core, you have to use command line tools if you just want Bitcoin Core and HVI, but uh, HVI creating a user interface, so that will be more convenient. So that's 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 very nice too. And, and yes, this was my implementation. <laughs> yes, uh, I implemented HVI for Wasabi. Uh, HVI uh, and and uh, Nicholas took the code and put it into BTC Pay Vault. Uh, yes, that's the that's the story. In, in fact, there is another thing here which I'm I'm not quite sure because I, I actually looked at the story and looked at the screenshots. Uh, but I also noticed that Avalonia, which is the library, the UI library that Wasabi is using is used by BTC Pay Vault, but as I'm looking at the screenshots, they are actually using some kind of web framework to do the GUI, so uh, that's that's confusing, yeah. Mm. Did somebody grab the wrong stock photo? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, this is it's fucking awesome. Like, BTC Pay is becoming a goddamn beast, and... You know, like you like thank you for actually taking the time to try to fucking get a lot of the stuff you're doing in Wasabi into the actual C sharp library that, that you and Nicholas bounce back and forth because like yeah, that's why another project was able to roll this out. Yeah, that's a very interesting library. It's uh it's very stable and the code looks like spaghetti, but it works perfectly, so <laughs> I mean, it's it, that's just the reality on the developer side of things is people have the languages they know and they like to work with, and it's not going to be an easy thing to be like, go use something else. So having as, as many of these libraries maintained in different languages as possible, that's a very good thing for the pace of development in this space. <laughs> All right. And then next up, this is actually really fucking cool. And like, I, I want to see um, this this keep moving forward. But uh, sixty one hundred two uh, Bitcoin only uh, wrote a, a Bitcoin privacy tool. Uh, he he just realized one day uh, timing analysis. You know, like looking at your your transactions in this address cluster are always happening in this time of day. Is is a way to really start trimming down the the anonymity site you're searching through and so he built this transaction cast tool um that just you you pretty much dump the the raw transactions into it and it just randomizes a uh, time and pretty much builds a list with like random time intervals that it broadcasts the transaction at over tor to a uh, blockstream infos api and i've been talking to him a lot about this um, right now, he just has it implemented as like just a thing you run yourself. You just manually put the transactions in there. But I think this could make a lot of sense to build out as a a service where it's like, you know, yeah, chiefly, I hope people would run this themselves at home. But you could 
just set this up and leave this open as a service to just take transactions and just randomize their broadcast time from anywhere. Like you, you could hook your, your friends and family up to that. And to go even a step further, um, the, the more core developers have been looking into Dandelion, it's looking more and more like it just might not happen because it, it just opens up so many denial of service vector or attack vectors in the mempool logic and just starts getting really complex. So if, if he builds this out as kind of a service tool that you can run and wallets can just, just blast a transaction off to, you can even go a step further and let's just implement dandelion as a, a completely independent second layer so that all of the people running a transaction cast server could also route things like dandelion and then just spit it back out into the main network and then you don't even have to worry about any of the the dos issues at least in bitcoin core because you're making it its own independent overlay network and so like i can really see this becoming a big tool set and it's literally he just thought one day oh that's a problem. And then just got off his ass and coded a fucking thing to deal with that problem. And like, yeah, th there needs to be more of that in this space. Like people should look at Bitcoin only here and, you know, follow his example. Cause there is a lot of fucking shit that can be done in this space. That is just super simple, low hanging fruit. Just start doing it. Regarding your dandelion idea. I don't see why wouldn't that work it's that's the final phase of dandelion to broadcast it to everyone who is on the network right it just it's I'm just a second that, layer on top of it so it, i think it, that makes perfect sense no i'm saying it makes perfect sense for like him to incorporate that into transaction cast but i'm saying like it's looking more and more like it's not going to make it into bitcoin core itself just because it's it's so complicated as far as the mempool logic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean uh transaction cast is is different from the underlying and and they are solving similar problems but not the same because the cast wants to completely defeat every kind of time correlation right uh so yeah but that's the thing if you have a software service that does transaction cast but also does dandelion between a, a node or like a network of, of these transaction cast nodes, you can do both. Fuck, you can compose the two. I can spit it off through a dandelion stem and then have the end of the stem do a fucking randomized broadcast. But the point is like, it, it's looking like dandelion won't make it into the, the actual Bitcoin core peer to peer protocol. And so if it doesn't, let's just fucking do it ourselves. And he's already building a fucking tool on its own that is a nice privacy tool. And it can easily do something like Dandelion too. And you can compose the random broadcast time with Dandelion on top of that. I mean, it's, it's, that, that just seems like a no-brainer to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, Dandelion and Tor is pretty much... Uh... I wouldn't want to say replaceable because for Dandelion you still want to use Tor a little bit at least, but uh, yeah, yeah. So it's you know like you know sixty one oh two like I disagree with him on a lot of stuff, but you know this is a guy who's got his head on right, actually willing to jump in and build a solution to problems, and it's like you know follow his example. And you think this is practical? I mean, I can see use cases for this, but yeah. uh, mostly people wouldn't want to use this because you would have to wait. It, I mean, it, think about yeah. it. Anything you're doing managing your cold storage, you can wait. Like anybody, like, you know, me, I, I live off Bitcoin. I okay, have the, okay. the cash card. Like I can, like, I, I'll wait a little bit for my deposit to hit there. I'll just top it up at a time. You, like, you know I mean? I think this, a lot of shit could find use in this. Yes, and then even, I missed the point. You could even go a step further. Instead of completely randomizing your broadcast time, 
How about you intentionally only broadcast during the active times in, say, China, even though you live in South America? Instead <laughs> of just completely hide in random noise, you can intentionally misdirect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is a question. Isn't it random enough already? If you are over Tor, then isn't your broadcasting times are random enough already because... It's like every broadcast is coming from a different person, so but you still it's time of day. You know what I mean? If you if you if this transaction clusters transactions are like always hitting chain between like six and fourteen like GMT, then okay, the guy's probably somewhere in that time zone. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like I, I think but this how do you know that? How do you know that that guy is like like okay okay he, here is me. How do you how do you know that when when am I broadcasting? What's what's the most likely? Because it hits chain. It see you see it in the mempool. Like th there's no way to hide if I'm running a, a node when your shit hits my mempool. Like what block it gets into. I mean, of course there is. Not if okay, I'm so, running so, a well-connected uh, node specifically trying to analyze all those things. Okay, so you, you are trying to analyze what exactly? I mean, dude, it's look at Bitcoin. Look at things like the darknet markets. Like you, like all of the little things that add up. Okay, um, now I know which continent to really focus my search in on. Where where is this darknet market? And it's all these little stupid things like that that can just narrow it just enough they'll fucking find something sifting through the sand. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's like, th this deals with this, er, or that problem. And it's so stupidly composable with a, a bunch of other things, and like, just dialable with a knob. Like, you know what I mean? Randomize to this, randomize completely, always fit this profile. Like, you can really play around with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alrighty. So I guess we beat that one to death. Yes. Let's just hold on. All right. Next up, your sponsored message from Black. <laughs> I can't even keep a straight face. But... Okay. Um, guys, there's not really much here. Uh, just a quick announcement that uh, Hodl Hodl um, now supports liquid trading. So you can actually um, go back and forth between liquid Bitcoin or Bitcoin on the main chain through HODL HODL or probably directly from other currency pairs. But you know, it's, it's another option now for you to try to squeeze out of that network if you're using it uh, with a different degree of bend over, sir. So I mean, that's going to be an interesting option going forward. Awesome. Like. Just a reminder, if you're a U.S. citizen, you're not allowed to use HODL HODL. Wink, wink. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, you know, I, I'm kind of actually interested to see in like the next year or two, like what, what on and off ramps for liquid have more liquidity? Is it going to be all the, the little ones on the edges that don't have KYC or very minimal KYC? Or is all the, the pegging in and out going to be through the, the big institutions actually running it and bend over, sir? Because it's like that, that is a really big factor in terms of how open and how censorship resistant that network could be. Like if, if the only real liquidity is through big platforms like Finex or Coinbase or yada yada, it's it's not going to be a very open system. But if there are a million different options like BISC or HODL HODL where you can get in and out with no KYC or KYC light, then that's going to be a much more open censorship resistant network. And you know it's it's really just kind of interesting to think about. Like, it, it's where that liquidity flows is what decides whether or not this, this network can actually function a little bit more like an open system versus like a completely closed down walled garden. Oh my god, you have no opinions on anything. Nice. Okay, Blockstream paid announcement, done. 
Janine, I think Good that's boy, you. Shinobi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the next uh, story is about what not to do with your money uh, if you're uh, if you have any idea what you're doing. Uh, so basically there's an article published two days ago in USA Today, ironically, USA two days ago, uh, about yet another cryptocurrency investor who has been the victim of a SIM swap attack uh, related to their Bitcoin. And the article is titled, Bitcoin, uh, Banks, Bitcoin, Bond Funds, Where is Your Money Safe in an Era of Cyber Attacks? Um, first of all, I would like to state that I find it hilarious that the, this bit, this whole article basically implies like the reason cryptocurrency is not safe is because it's usually not FDIC insured, which is like, are you, are you serious? Do you really think that, <laughs> that that's, that's all there is? Um, anyway, for, yeah. F- so for almost a decade, the article says a guy named John Luxick, uh, used a Bitcoin exchange, which turns out to be Coinbase to invest money in cryptocurrencies, trying to build a nest egg while caring for his parents in Saginaw, Michigan. Then, just days after Christmas, nearly $90,000 worth of Bitcoin was emptied from a 60-year-old's account by cyber crooks, he says. Imagine waking up one day and almost everything you have is gone, um, says Luxick, who previously worked in sales. How can I lose everything I own? He hasn't been made whole, and after talking with investigators, is pessimistic about ever recovering the money. Luxick says he was a victim of SIM swapping, a cybersecurity attack where criminals steal a person's phone number. Well, steal steal is a strong word because you don't actually own the phone number to begin with, which is why this whole problem exists. Um, furthermore, he says that he has uh, spoken with an attorney and is, I don't know if you can hear the cat right now, but the cat is <laughs> trying, trying to give her input. Um Luxick has spoken with an attorney and is seeking to file a lawsuit. Um, And then the bottom of the article goes on about uh, whether you can claim insurance protection uh, when you have this kind of incident through the FDIC. And they say Bitcoin exchanges like Coinbase have insurance that covers loss or theft from a hack on their entire system but not hacks on individual accounts. Some Coinbase funds that are held as dollars in bank accounts are also insured by the FDIC. Um, yeah, again, I like the implication that, oh, it doesn't have FDI, FDIC insurance, you're screwed. And that, yeah, because you're not screwed to begin with. Um, anyway, besides the fact that uh, this goes to show that it's a terrible idea to store that much Bitcoin in a custodial exchange, um, if you do decide to do that, we are, the cat is about to tip a box one second. All right, as I was saying, um, so... If you are a person who decides to make the terrible mistake of putting that much Bitcoin in a custodial exchange as an account, uh, which is not a bank, it's not like a bank account, it's an exchange, um, we are reminded with this story why SMS-based 2FA is not a good security mechanism because it assumes that phone numbers are good identifiers, that they are something that we control when they are not. Um, I've talked a number of times, I have a blog post even about misconceptions about phone security and the way phones work. Like you'd be surprised how many people think that text messages are private or uh, that phone networks are decentralized and all of this stuff. Um, Very weird. But uh, if you do have accounts, whether they're cryptocurrency accounts or messaging accounts or anything like that, um, that use SMS-based 2FA and that service has other options, please, as soon as possible, switch to something else uh, like an authenticator app or a hardware security key. There's a number of uh, websites and services that do that now. Twitter actually recently, um, I can't remember if they allowed hard I haven't checked if they allow for hardware security keys but they do allow I think for um authenticator apps like Google Authenticator and stuff like that which is better because uh the fact like there's a lot of a, of accounts a lot of services that force you to give a phone number and that puts you at risk of this kind of attack even if you're not using the 2FA part, um, they could figure out how to use that to take control of your account, which is what happened to Jack Dorsey. Um, so if you're doing, if you're using a service that offers other options, um, please set that up. It's good for you. Uh, SMA-based uh, 2FA is not. 
Um, if you're using a service that doesn't give you those options, you should probably consider uh, whether you should continue using that service, especially if it's a cryptocurrency thing, because uh, especially when you don't control their, your keys, um, you have to be very aware of the options that they give you in terms of accessing your coins. And if one of those options is, I have a phone number, and that means that I control this money or I have access to this money, well, there's a lot of other people who could uh, become that person besides you. So don't use that. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, Coinbase made multiple billions of dollars they could use to, uh, I don't know, send an automated message to users who leave money sitting there for too long and go, hey, we have this vault thing that actually makes a multi-sig we can't just unilaterally spend from. You should use that. Ah, they don't have the money for anything like that. Or, I don't know, recommend, I mean, even the, there's hardware wallets that act as 2FA devices. I mean, I don't know how great they are, but that's, any, like, anything they offer is going to be better than SMS stuff. So, mm -hmm. like, you know, you could recommend that. You could recommend a hardware wallet. Um, although, maybe they see that as competition, and that's why they don't do it. But regardless, this is just ridiculous that this keeps happening, and a bunch of exchanges are still doing this shit. Mm-hmm. God knows, we don't have the time and money for this, though. Actual security? I'm sorry, we have 10 shit coins to get listed by the end of the month. Incentives are a funny thing. Ah, oh, man. So that punching bag was not as fun as it's been historically. You guys want to try a new one? Let's try a new one. So there is no way anybody listening has not heard about the BCH development fund proposal at this point. I'm going to just keep this real short and sweet. Uh, BTC top and, and some subset of miners, roughly around a third of the Bcash network, decided that they're going to start requiring 12.5% of the Bcash Coinbase reward get locked up with a fund for six months that has had a foundation set up in Hong Kong to manage this and handle funding Bcash and the development side of that. And the interesting thing is here that they specifically go to point this out is that Bitcoin actually indirectly bears some of the cost of that because when Bcash becomes less profitable, some of those miners will move back to Bitcoin and make that slightly less profitable for everybody. So it actually smooths out the, the incurred cost for miners across all SHA-256 coins. And they are planning on orphaning any non-compliant blocks. Now, the, the real interesting thing is the cognitive dissonance here. This is being pitched as not a protocol upgrade. So they're going to orphan blocks because they're going to run special software that, that, that adds extra restrictive rules. And it's not a fucking software change to the protocol, guys. It's just an optional thing. We're all donating. Not a soft fork. I mean, come on. Nobody finds that hilarious. Like, that is literally the definition of a minor activated and enforced soft fork. And they're trying to pretend this isn't a protocol change or a fork. Yes, this is uh, hilarious. And then... Um, I mean, they are... Th they are experimenting, trying to figure out the things that we have already settled on. And this is their experiment and see how it, I mean, they will see how it, it, it will end. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to, to just, just laugh. But it's funny and it gets even funnier. Roger Ver was trying to defend this. While all of the Bcash lunatics started calling him out on the hypocrisy of a coercive tax that he was backing, constantly trying to rationalize and defend how that's... No, it's not a tax. It's just a voluntary thing where your block will get orphaned if you don't cough up the money. <laughs> and um, they ended up backing down. Uh, 
Bitcoin.com published a, a post today, I think, saying that they are no longer going to go forward with supporting this developer fund pulled out of the, the block reward. And the rationalization oh. for it was even better that, oh, well, it's because we just aren't sure what the money is going to get spent on because we don't know what developers want to do or need. So we're going to not do this now, but you know all the developers should put together business plans and budgets. And then we'll have the conversation again because that's how business works. Yeah, I don't, I can't remember who it is. It might be. I don't know if it's the developer, but I saw someone tweet about how, you know, I've, I've, I think he said he lost, he's either lost or, um, put up over $200,000 of his own money. Um, I, I guess I, I think he was implying he hasn't been paid for doing development work and that's how much it was worth. And he was like, well, that's not even 1% of, um, you know, a lot of your net worths. So why aren't you willing to do this? And everyone was like, well, if, <laughs> you know, if no one wants to pay you that, uh, maybe it's because they don't value the network as much as you thought they did. Also, there's something in the back of my mind, scratch. Oh, yeah, didn't Roger a while back pledge $200 million to, to support Bcash development? $200 million. Why do they need to pull $6 million out of the Coinbase reward if, if Roger says he has $200 million to spend on development? What's up with that, man? Yeah, it's like a lot of these... Uh, Bitcoin forks seem to have a problem with having a lot of money and then suddenly getting an allocation issue where it's like, we thought you had this money, but we don't know where it went and people aren't getting paid who should be paid. It's like, why does this keep happening? Mm. At least they don't have a foundation or do they? I don't actually know. Do they have a foundation? Because that would be like, you know, super repetitive that this keeps happening with foundations. I don't no, think I don't think so. I don't think it's called that, but there definitely is a thing like it. What the hell is it called? The B Bitcoin BCH Cash Fund or something? Is that what it was called? I'm, I'm not sure, but that should be right. That sounds like something they would call a foundation. Yeah, so this is, uh, is going to be funny. Why didn't I they just... try to call it... They should have just went with Hash Cash. You know? <laughs> they would have... I would have, you know... Would have really played on the irony oh my god i would have died yeah at, the, at, the, at this point though i want to see if if the btc top faction sticks with it because like how are you gonna like do this you're just splitting the the chain again you're, you're just <laughs> making another b cash so just 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 in general i bitcoin cash is is not any threat to Bitcoin or anywhere close to threaten it in, in any time in the future. And I'm not, so it's, it's like when, when we are talking about Bitcoin cash, it's like, like sitting on an old sick, desperate person. And I really don't like that, to be honest. You don't like making fun of people who run into problems that they created entirely for themselves when everybody around them was warning that those problems would be created? No, that's okay for a while, but it's like two years, three years since it gets old. Craig Wright's pretty old. Are we allowed to make fun of him? Yes. I, I just think <laughs> it, gets, it gets funnier. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then explain the next news how it gets funnier well that's a radical topic shift very loosely related but i still think there is a connection there isn't there janine wait are, are we talking about your story or my story <laughs> oh we're, we're shifting on to you now okay um well this this is actually i i thought we might have covered this but maybe we missed it um this was news at the end of 2019 where uh, it was it was announced that um, private internet access, uh, which is a VPN company that unfortunately uh, acquired uh, what's his name Falkvenge, um, another Bcash extraordinaire person, 
um, <laughs> the fame. What what I I have the image of a chimp in my mind. I care. Oh yeah, he wrote this whole paper about how uh, something about monkeys, and we did a whole episode around that joke. But anyway, private internet access not the smartest bunch of people to begin with, um, considering that they added Falkvenge. But they then uh, allowed themselves to be acquired by a company um, called Cape Technologies, or at least that's what it's called now, Cape. Um, but it used to be, um, I think in I think this article says in 2018, if you. Uh, it's written by RestorePrivacy.com, which, by the way, is a great website um, if you're looking for privacy-conscious um, or um, privacy-focused uh, software and tools. Um, also, they have a long list of um, Google alternatives, which is good. Um, but they basically wrote this blog post highlighting the fact that this company that acquired um, Private Internet Access, or PIA, um, is actually a malware company, <laughs> which seems like a, you know, a giant mm. contradiction. Um, so as they write, uh, if you take a minute to research Crossrider, which is the original name of Cape Technologies, you see that as a company that built a bad reputation from creating malware and adware products. There are many different articles about Crossrider's malware and adware, such as an article from Malwarebytes. Crossrider offers a highly configurable method for its clients to monetize their software. The common method is to infect end users um, through the software bundles. The installers usually resort to browser hijacking. Targeted browsers are Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, and sometimes Opera. Crossrider not only targets Windows machines, but Macs as well. Uh, there's a, I think the ins it's the name of the installer, pup.optional.crossrider installs um, are typically triggered by bundler, uh, bundlers that offer software you might be interested in and combine them with adware or other monetizing methods. Now, why might these two, why, why might a company that does this kind of shit be interested in VPNs? Well, a lot of VPNs, uh, that don't yet have a monetization model. Um, a lot of free VPNs. Uh, they are they are looking for ways to um, basically find a way to make money without actually being honest and asking for money, um, or you know maybe becoming a paid only thing um, because that's actually sustainable. Uh, but yeah, to have a to have a malware company acquire a VPN wall to actually they've already acquired another VPN um, prior to this. So this is not their first time, but I, I think, yeah, I think this should be a wake up call to people who still consider VPNs to always be security tools. They're not when you're looking for a VPN to use, you should give it, you should apply the same due diligence as you would to an internet service provider, because that's basically what you're getting. You're getting, you're getting a secondary ISP and, you know, depending on the kinds of, um, tooling that they offer, you may be exposing yourself to them in the same way that you would normally be exposed to your ISP in terms of their ability to look at your traffic. So yeah, I would not be too enthusiastic about um, using a product from a company that its literal business model is to bundle their tools or help other people bundle their tools with stuff that undermines your security rather than help it. So yeah, if you, if you, if you are still using private internet access, uh, which I hope you're not, uh, you should probably stop because there is no telling whether they've already implemented this. I haven't, I haven't looked to see if anyone has actually checked their software to see if they're trying any of this crap um but there's nothing stopping them from doing it in the future because that is their incentive in their business model and that's probably why private internet access was interested because as far as i i think i can't remember if they did i think they did have a paid version but i also think that they let you use it for free i'm not sure there's a lot of free VPNs out there and sometimes they become monetized in different ways. So I can't remember, but 
yeah, this is not a good sign. Don't don't use this shit. <laughs> well, what? Aren't the NSA supposed to be like all the big tech experts and stuff? Wouldn't they have like the best VPN service? Yeah, I, I bet they do. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah. I I honestly I mean that think about it that would be that would be a great way for the NSA to like surveil at least well because anyone who wants to use a VPN I mean not everyone who uses a VPN is doing things that are illegal Pe a lot of people just do it because they want to get around geolocation blockers and getting around geolocation blockers is not illegal it at best is maybe a violation of terms of service but a lot of people are just using it for innocuous reasons. But think about it. Um, <laughs> it would not surprise me at all if the NSA is trying to run some kind of VPN service somehow or already is. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I mean, as, as far as I'm concerned, like my attitude on VPNs is that's protecting you from your ISP seeing what you're doing. And that is literally it. Like, if, if you are trying to obscure anything to anybody else, you should be using Tor or I2P, or you shouldn't be doing things on the internet. Well, uh, and so, I mean, at best, yeah, it's protecting you maybe from your ISP, and then it's at least, hopefully, if it's implemented correctly and you're using it correctly, it's not disclosing your IP address and stuff to whatever website you're looking at. But if you're... For example, using a VPN to log into Twitter, obviously they know mm -hmm. that Twitter no, Twitter knows who you are. Just because you're using a VPN doesn't mean you're like it doesn't mean it's like secret or something. It just means that they're not getting your IP address. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so so let's not forget that the their main reason or their use case of VPNs is actually circumventing government censorship. It's like in in Indonesia, I couldn't get on Reddit, although I use Tor, but VPN would have done much better job because it's at least faster, right? Yeah, and I mean that's a that's a useful tool, but I'm just saying, like from the point of view of privacy, like that VPN is maybe helping with the site you're on if it's not account tied or anything and your ISP and that's it like you you should not be counting on a VPN to protect your privacy from an actually resourceful oppressive government like yeah get content that they are blocking yeah but you should not count on that to to just completely hide your identity from them well, obviously yeah anyone does anyone thinks otherwise oh dude that's normies think a vpn is magic dude i act it's it's a i actually get really irritated when i see how many like youtube creators and shit are sponsored by vpns because it's a oh, double-edged yeah. sword like yeah it's good that more people use them but they sell them as like magic like it's just a magic shield against everything and th you that's not be the case more secure on the internet use nord vpn <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Not to mention, there, wasn't, there. wasn't Nord the one that was violating their entire terms of service by actually stealing residential bandwidth uh, from users with their clients to use as VPN outpoints? I, I, I haven't heard that, but the one thing that I did hear about NordVPN is that their, um, their infrastructure security is questionable. <laughs> yeah, that's a joke like their reliability is a joke and they were they were literally just if you installed their app they were using your ip as an outpoint for other customers shit yeah I, that's I, not bad privacy solution though no i mean if there are peer-to-peer -peer vpns that work like that but they did that without telling their users and without clearly going that this is what's going on here yeah, it's it's kind of dangerous, right? Because whoever is doing whatever on, uh, yeah, it, it's very dangerous. I, mm -hmm. I swear to God, ha like basically half of YouTubers, they're either sponsored by NordVPN, Squarespace, or Skillshare. <laughs> it's uh -huh. those three. 
Um, but yeah, so the, the joke earlier joking about the NSA, that's actually, it's not a complete joke because, um, later in the same article, um, they link to a prior Forbes article that, um, kind of profiled the, the founder or why way to see the founder. Well, I, I think he might be the founder, but, um, they, they just say he has a majority stake. So the majority stakeholder of, Crossrider, which is this the prior name of the company that acquired PIA, is billionaire Teddy Saki, who um, is an ex-con who was jailed for insider trading in the 1990s. His biggest money maker to date is gambling uh, software developer Playtech. Um, he was also oh, there's another guy who's a um, he was a developer at a company called Unit um, 8200. Don't. Oh, and they explained further. So 8, 000, unit 8,200, um, yeah, they say, what went unnoticed until now is that most of the search, uh, most of the searchable organizations involved in this potentially dangerous business are based in Israel that also happen to have links to the nation's military and its top signals intelligence agency, the Israeli equivalent of the NSA or GCHQ, unit 8,200, which works out of the Israel Defense Forces. Um, so <laughs> not... Not completely off there. The hell are you doing, Udi? Because and and for anyone who says, well, you know, that's a different company. There's no proof that they're like the the way these people work when they have when they have top level connections like that. Just because they move on to a different company, they they are not going to lose those connections. They're going to leverage them or be leveraged by them for pretty much a very long time if not the rest of their life so that they could still very well be influencing um what he's still doing it's it's not necessarily in the past mm -hmm. that is how those worlds work all right so are we ready for a little bit of comic relief in between now and the last story big moves are being made in the payment processing side of this ecosystem folks Big waves, big moves. XRPP is now supported by BitPay in their own marketing speak, bringing the assets they support to roughly 80% of the total market capitalization for all cryptocurrencies. By the way, Segwit coming soon. And that's going to skyrocket and help grow the entire market for global cross-border payments because that's xrpp's entire nonsense narrative guys how long until bitpay just like starts scrambling around desperately to raise more money because they are just running on empty i mean like come on okay that, that's enough i mean bitcoin for a long time and I just can't figure out why is Reaper still a thing. Just, just why? Who's who's using that? Who's advocating for it? Just what's what's seriously? It's I don't even know, man. You know, even you know, coin shuffle, coin shuffle plus plus value shuffle. But what you might not know that there was actually a Reaper shuffle. That Tim Ruffing and the other guys created. Why? Dude, it makes no sense. It's 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 a federated network where everybody picks their own federation. Yeah, nothing can go wrong there at all. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's I, I mean, dude, it's sock puppets. It's shady twisting of headlines and it's just dumping the endless supply of xrp on suckers i mean i'm amazed that they haven't actually had massive enforcement action taken against them by some regulator like it blows my mind maybe that's what they are good at but anyway um bitpay adds another pointless dead-end shitcoin instead of working on things like integrating segwit to to you know bring the cost down for the currency that 80 percent of their payments are looking into lightning now nope we got 10 more shitcoins to add this month guys what right. is bitpay is that some btc pay fork <laughs> i think so ah the tick transit <laughs> all right next all right 
round us out with the last story, Janine. Meow. Oh, sorry. I, I have to keep making sure that I select the mumble window before I talk. Anyway, so in lieu of the fact that I keep giving um, updates about Assange, uh, this is kind of a related story because um, Glenn Greenwald has um, basically been targeted with the same kind of charges that Assange is, but in Brazil. Um, so I'm just going to read a portion of the Colombian Journalism Review. Um, Brazil's attack on Greenwald mirrors the U.S. case against Assange because it, they have a really good summary of what happened. Just a second. Do, 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 okay. Do, do. Elevator music done. Okay. So um, they write, The Intercept has published a number of articles based on um, the leaked messages, stories that raise questions about a corruption investigation involving some of Brazil's most powerful players in both business and politics. As the New York Times describes, the stories question the integrity of the judge who oversaw that investigation, a man named Sergio Moro, who is now Bolsonaro's Minister of Justice. The case resulted in a number of powerful businessmen and political figures going to prison, including former Brazilian president uh, Lula da Silva, uh, a popular leftist. His departure in turn created an opening for Bolsonaro, a man who is often compared to Donald Trump because of his right-wing leanings and his use of social media as a weapon for pursuing vendettas against the media and others. Um, but yeah, Bolsonaro, as an aside, he's quite a he's quite a character, and I swear to God, like if if you if you follow Greenwald uh, at all, you will know <laughs> exactly how much of an asshole that guy is. But if you don't, uh, just just go back and look through the history. There's there's stuff with uh, peeing and all of yeah, just weird weird shit going on um like not not becoming of a president anyway um last year he called greenwald a derogatory term and warned that he quote might wind up in jail the criminal complaint filed against greenwald says that the intercepts brazilian operation which he founded didn't just receive the hacked messages and then publish some of them in news stories instead it argues that greenwald cooperated with the hackers and that he therefore played a clear role in facilitating the commission of a crime among other things, the prosecutors say that Greenwald encouraged the hackers to delete archives of leaked material in order to make it more difficult to connect them with the leaks. They also argue that the Intercept writer was in communication with the hackers while they were listening in on private conversations through apps such as Telegram. Oh god, facepalm, don't use Telegram. And that therefore he had ceased to operate as a journalist and instead became a member of a criminal conspiracy. This strategy, trying to paint a journalist as an active participant in a crime as opposed to just the recipient of leech material, is clearly a heinous act on freedom of the press protections, something journalists and anyone in favor of free speech should be up in arms about. But it doesn't exist in a vacuum. The case against Greenwald happens to be almost a carbon copy of the Justice Department's argument in an affidavit filed against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange last year which contains more than a dozen charges under the Espionage Act. Just like the Brazilian government, the U.S. prosecutors tried to make the case that Assange didn't just receive leaked diplomatic cables and other information from former Army staffer Chelsea Manning, but that he actively participated in the hack and leaks and therefore doesn't deserve the protection of the First Amendment. Which, by the way, um, that last part is very interesting because... Um, as it says, the argument that the U.S. prosecutors put forth is that the First Amendment doesn't apply because this is about hacking, this isn't about journalism. And the language of the indictment against him does very much focus on the like this, this charge or accusation that he was involved in the hacking. But when you actually read the details of what he did, it really wasn't hacking at all. And what he did was just, I mean, or at least it should be standard journalistic practice, which um, basically amounted to him helping Chelsea Manning try to remain anonymous and um, not easily get caught and leave fingerprints um, of the fact that she had been in certain systems, but he did not actually participate in any of that. At least the evidence doesn't support that. So, yeah, um, I should also note that besides, um, you know, as terrible as this is, uh, this also, like, there's been a, a series of, uh, let's say, 
problems with source protection at the intercept, um, whether it's actual mistakes that they made or that the government has, you know, highlighted certain applications that they use or methods of contact um, that were not secure as proof that they aren't journalists because look they failed to protect their sources and therefore they this doesn't fall under the first amendment which you know as bad as as some of their uh, technical skills are that's a ridiculous argument when what we're facing today with adversaries that are so much technologically superior so much more technologically superior than um even some of the best journalists out there. Um, that's just not, that's not a very good argument as to whether the first amendment applies, because basically what they're saying is that the first amendment will never apply as long as you have these intelligence agencies who have the capabilities to undermine uh, journalists ability to protect their sources when they're using these tools. So that's, that, really sucks. Um, but funnily enough, the US government has recently shifted, at least in the Assange case, they've shifted their argument from uh, this is about hacking, not journalism, therefore no for no First Amendment to he's a foreign national, therefore no First Amendment, which is a terrible argument. Um, if you know anything about the Supreme Court um, and cases that they have seen and made opinions on and made ju judgments about regarding whether constitutional protections apply to um, non-U.S. citizens, they are absolutely clear that there are some protections in the Constitution that apply to everyone, regardless of whether they're a U.S. citizen or not. And one of them is the First Amendment. So um, good luck fighting the Supreme Court with that one, uh, Virginia. Yeah, I mean, this is like... <sighs> This is not going to be the last time this happens in the next few years. Like each case of a journalist being prosecuted like this is just going to domino more. Like the, the more jurisdictions play shit like this, the more we're going to test the waters. Like, oh, can we actually get away with this? And I mean, that's a really scary thing to think about. Yeah, and the I mean, Greenwald is. I haven't. I haven't really checked. Um, how it's going as of today but he's going to be in a sticky situation because basically i mean if i i mean it's possible that the u.s government might be pursuing him regarding i mean they're going to be pursuing him regarding snowden because he was actually involved in that and met snowden in hong kong and everything and was uh well he was responsible for getting the archive of documents to the public and that kind of ended because the intercept is a bit of a clusterfuck um uh but they might also be interested in him regarding um the diamond against assange who knows i don't think he was he was not nearly involved as much with that but basically he's not in a great position because if brazil is going to go really hard against him uh i don't know how much protection he's going to get from the US because basically if they if they had the opportunity they would probably charge him with the same stuff or at least attempt to charge him with that. So he's in a sticky situation there. I'm not expecting the the US to go to bat like they would in a analogous situation with somebody else. And uh, I mean it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me at all if the US is actually like behind this like pushing for him to be charged through brazil because mm -hmm. because then they don't because like they're they're already dealing with you know, backlash for how they're treating chelsea manning how they're treating snowden and now how they're treating assange uh most of all recently so if they add greenwald to the list uh they're just going to like look like they're prosecuting everyone on the face of the earth so might as well have brazil do it because you're like oh bad brazil bad but of course you're still feeding the dog so keep doing that mm -hmm. yeah i think uh i think there's a very real possibility that over the next 20 years we see real journalism become something that you just can't do in most places. That's not a good direction for things. 
It's not. Anyone has anything to add to this, or should we move on to the final thoughts? I don't really have anything, unless Janine does. Nope. All right. Who's got something that isn't a bummer to think about to take us out on? I got one. So I would urge everyone to prepare for the end of the world and buy some face mask and some Bitcoin and you'll be fine. I'm out. <laughs> you, you got anything, Jenny? I I was looking for something, um, but no, I don't. I don't think I have anything. The first thing that came to my mind is that it's not even like it's not even a final thought, but it kind of is. It's that. Um, uh, the ebook, the ebook reader, remarkable, looks pretty cool, and I'm going to remind you about it again because I want to get it, and you should too. I hate you. <laughs> this is not a sponsored ad. I just, I really like it. I hate you. All right, you know, I, I think I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do, do something interesting here. I'm gonna take us out with the, the crazy conspiracy theory about the coronavirus that's so fucking crazy. Even I think it's crazy. So this VC oh, dude, no. Adam is Townsend, is, is convinced that the whole virus is bullshit and made up and it's just a narrative that the Chinese government made up to sweep up all the dissidents in the country and just disappear them. So I'm going to leave you guys with that one. Crazy conspiracy theories. Have fun with it. Catch you later, punks. Oh, no. <laughs> Was